time for me And you know, uh, last week we had Easter. Do you know that about a quarter of the songs that we sing around here have to do with the crucifixion? But that's, that's our message, isn't it? Isn't that the message of Christians? It says that we, we carry about the dying of the Lord Jesus. You know, we're testimony to the fact that if he didn't go to hell for us, if he didn't take our sins and put them in hell where they belong, we would have to take our sins and go to hell where we belong. Amen? But isn't that good news? That's real good news. We don't have to go there because Jesus already went and cleared it out. Amen? And that's, the, that's our message. That should be our message all the time to this world, everybody you meet, any chance you get. Tell them, hey, this, there's, this is good news. So we're going to do some more good news. But in the meantime, we have the Penny March today. Because the first week was Easter. All right. So, so how many kids do we have here? And how many wannabe kids? All right. So we got a full house. All right. All right, we ready? Jesus, we celebrate your victory. Jesus, we revel in your love. Jesus, we rejoice you set us free. Jesus, your breath has brought us life. It was for freedom that Christ has set us free. No longer to be subject to the yoke of slavery. So we're rejoicing in this victory our hearts 
responding to your love. Jesus, we celebrate your victory. Jesus, we revel in your love. Jesus, we rejoice you set us free. Jesus, your death has brought us life. Come on, come on, Derek. Spirit in us releases us from fear. The way to Him is open. In boldness we draw near. And in His presence, a problem disappears. Our heart responding to His love. His great love. Jesus. We celebrate your victory, Jesus. We revel in your love, Jesus. We rejoice you set us free, Jesus. Your death has brought us life. Let's do it, Jesus. We celebrate your victory, Jesus. We revel in your love, Jesus. We rejoice you set us free, Jesus. Your death has brought us life, Jesus. Your death has brought us life, Jesus. Your death has brought us life. Look, and Barb had to be the last one to put stuff in. Don't, don't blame it on the kids. She's picking them up off the floor. <laughs> well, are we done with this penny march? Yes, we are. So now I'm really sad. No, I'm not. Christ is my reward. And all of my devotion Now there's nothing in this world That could ever satisfy Through every trial My soul will sing No turning back I've been set free Christ is enough for me Christ is enough for me Everything I need is in you Everything I need Let's sing that again. Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. 
everything I need is in you. Everything I need. Christ, my all in all, the joy of my salvation. And this hope will never fail. Heaven is our home. Through every storm, my soul will sing, Jesus is here. To God be the glory. Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. Everything I need is in you. Everything I need. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. The cross, the cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back, no turning back. Oh, cause Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. Everything I need is in you. Everything I need, oh Christ, is enough for me. You're enough for me. You're everything I need. Everything I need, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back, no, no turning back. No turning back, no forward, no turning back, no turning back. I have made you too small in my eyes. 
Oh Lord, forgive me, and I have believed in a lie that you were unable to help me. But now, oh Lord, I see my wrong. Heal my heart and show yourself strong. And in my eyes and in my song, oh Lord, be magnified. Oh Lord, be magnified. Be magnified, oh Lord. highly exalted and there is nothing you can do oh Lord my eyes are on you be magnified oh Lord be magnified I have lived on the wisdom of men Oh Lord Forgive me And I have responded to them Instead of your life and your mercy But now, oh Lord I see my wrong Heal my heart And show yourself strong And in my eyes And in my song Oh Lord Be magnified Oh Lord Be magnified Oh Lord, you are highly exalted, and there is nothing you can do. Oh Lord, my eyes are on you, be magnified. Magnify, oh, be magnified, oh Lord. You are highly exalted, and there is nothing you can do, oh Lord. My eyes are on you. Well, we're going to magnify the Lord right now. But well, we got a prayer request that came in. How many of you know Michael Romer, who uh, brings Dylan in in the wheelchair? They were just rushed Mike to the hospital just a couple minutes ago. And so we're going to lift up Mike Romer right now, okay? Amen. Father God, <clears throat> we just sang the song, and there is nothing you can't do. Oh, Lord, our eyes are on you. 
Father God, we ask that you would just move in this situation with Mike Romer right now. We don't know what's going on. Doctors are examining him at this moment. But Father God, greater is he that's in Mike than he that is in the world. Father God, we thank you right now that you're able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we might ask or think according to your power that lives in us and lives in Mike also right now. So Father, right now we ask that you would just move in that situation and grant perfect soundness in his body. Father, whatever is going on, it would be completely eradicated right now. Father God, that it would be something that just, Mike just says, I'm, I'm, I feel great right now. Father, we are asking for healing for Mike Romer right now in the name of Jesus. Father, your people are praying. We're looking to you right now. We're thanking you, Father God, for this day that the Bible says that in the last days there's going to be some perilous times, some difficult times, some treacherous times, some tough times. But right in the middle of all those tough times, there you are. We've sung that song before. There he is. Well, Lord, you're right here in the middle with us right now. In all these situations and no weapon that is formed against us shall prosper and every tongue that will rise up against us in judgment will condemn it. This is a heritage of the servants of the Lord, and our righteousness comes from you. We also want to thank you, Father God, right now that you're working in the midst of these ones who have had or had COVID or been diagnosed as having COVID or got the shots. Now they're having all these different things. Father God, right now, the Bible talks about one time where they didn't know which way to turn in Second Chronicles chapter 20. But that phrase, but our eyes are on you, made all the difference in the world. Our eyes are on you right now. And you are turning these situations that Satan meant for evil, you're turning them around for good so that your people are going to have a testimony about the test that they withstood because of Jesus Christ. So we thank you for that right now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's give the Lord glory. Amen. 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 Now don't uh, text Mike a lot right now and call or that the family has just asked that you just give him time to, to cycle through these things and you may be seated. Amen. Sarah, would you come at this time? Good morning, everyone. I wanted to say a special hi to Dana and Dennis who are with us today. <laughs> we missed you. We love you. <laughs> okay, for those interested in taking the Faith Bible Institute classes this fall, we're now registering and it's open. You can register at fbiclass.com. The website's in the bulletin and their pamphlets, like this in the foyer, on the table. And the tuition um, is pretty great. What happens is that you have to uh, pay uh, a little bit of a first-time enrollment fee. So your first semester is going to run about $157. That includes a student application fee of 25, tuition of 90, and a first time enrollment of 157. But after that, every single course is 115. And if you have a family member who joins you, it's 70. So they get half price on uh, that enrollment. So if you have a, and that includes every family member. So if four of you go, the first one would pay the 115 and then every family member after that would get the family discount of half price. So it's pretty fantastic. And I don't know of any college classes that are that reasonable. <laughs> and so that is signing up now and it's early enrollment so you get an extra discount because you're enrolling early. Um, it's a course that digs deeper into the Word of God. It's over three years but you can take as many classes as you like or as few as you'd like. It's up to you and your schedule. So registration is now open for fall. August 2021, which is the week of August 15th, okay? And then Saturday, April 24th at 5 p.m. is our pizza and praise night. And it's a, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a time of family style pizza and salad at individual tables so you can sit with your family or with your friends. Um, our very own Living Word Fellowship Praise Team will be leading worship on that evening. 
So feel free. <laughs> oh yeah, by the way, by the way, Teresa. <laughs> Our very own Living Word Fellowship Praise Team will be leading that that night. So feel free to stand up and join and worship like we do on Sunday mornings that night too. So that's what it's all about is praising God together. And feel, uh, So today after service, there is free complimentary tickets for the event, so make sure you get them today, okay? And then save the date, ladies, because our spring tea is coming up. And the date is Saturday, May 15th here in the sanctuary. There's going to be a catered lunch a raffle, and a fantastic guest speaker. But there's more information to come, so I'll let you know more. And tickets will be going on sale for that soon. And parents, be sure to be here next Sunday for our craft giveaway. Living Word has an abundance of supplies and wants to share them with families within our church. So be sure to stay after service next Sunday and meet in the fellowship hall to take home a bunch of crafts for your family. And all these events and more are in your bulletin, so you don't have to worry about the website for FBI class because it's right there in your bulletin and all the other information for dates and times and everything. And now we're going to receive this morning's tithe and offering. I think some of you may know this song. Shine, Jesus, shine, fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze, set our heart on fire. Flow, river, flow, flood the nation. With grace and mercy, send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. Lord, the light of your love is shining, in the midst of the darkness shining. Jesus, the light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free by the truth you now bring us. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Spirit blaze, set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow, flood the nation with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. Lord, I come to your awesome presence From the shadows into your radiance By the blood I may enter your brightness Search me, try me, consume all my darkness Shine on me Shine on me Shine, Jesus, shine Fill this land with the Father's glory. Play, Spirit, play. Set our hearts on fire. Oh, river flow, flood the nation with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. As we gaze on your kingly brightness See our faces despise your likeness Ever changing from glory to glory Mirror here, may our life tell your story Shine on me Shine on me Shine, Jesus, shine Fill this land with the Father's glory. 
Blaze, spirit, blaze, set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow, flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. Hallelujah. Isn't that a great song? If you ever get a chance, go online and look up... Uh, Hosanna Integrity, and look up a guy named Graham Kendrick. Listen to the whole side of that. You'll, you'll be up in heaven. But that was the last song on that side of that. Uh, great, great work that he had. So praise the Lord. Well, we're going to receive communion at this time. I'm going to ask also if uh, Dan Bertassi and Leonard would help me with communion this morning. And uh, we're, uh, Pam's going to stay in here right now so you can be, have communion, right? That's what she would like to do. And uh, I'd like the deacons to pass out the communion elements at this time if they would. We have open communion here. That means you don't have to be a member of this church. But you do have to be a member of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. You should have trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, and it makes all the difference in the world. Amen? All right. I'm still finding Easter eggs all over the place. Now I'm on. I'd like you to see from time to time the different uh, uh, elders and deacons and the different ones in this church. So if you have questions about uh, who's elders, who are deacons, you get to see them from time to time. They don't just sit in a chair and that, but they have responsibilities in this church also. I just got a little bit too much coming through the monitor right now. Can you turn that down a little bit? It's kind of shaking my feet as I talk. I, and I don't need it, okay? It's a little too loud when, when your feet start shaking. Amen? Amen. Well, we've celebrated communion many different ways throughout the years. We've had uh, husbands serve wives and wives serve husbands. We've had uh, deacon, uh, different ones in the church who had different ministries uh, bring communion and serve it to us. But uh, I think from time to time we need to just share a little bit what communion is all about. Because it's not just a mere formality and uh, you don't just want to do it. You know, I've had people say, well, we need to have communion every week. I've had people get mad at me and say, we need to have communion every week. And uh, why don't we have communion every week? And I say, well, because this is not a denominational church. This is a non-denominational church. And the Bible says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, do you know that you can have communion in your house? Okay. How many of you ever had an argument with your husband or wife? How, how many of you have ever had an argument with your children? Okay. Uh, we know one family that every time their teenagers and them would lock horns, they'd break out the bread and wine. And they'd, uh, they'd go through communion with their, with their children. And I don't think that's a bad thing either. Uh, I don't know if you could do that with your teachers and other ones that you lock horns with. But in the body of Christ, I don't think it would hurt from time to time if we're having problems with somebody to go to that person and say, hey, let's have a cup of coffee and have communion. 
because we need to get over some of these things. It's not important that you and I get have our own way. It is important, though, that we do things God's way. Amen? Okay. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The church, uh, when it first started out, they had problems with people. They would have these agape feasts, and some people would come in there and they would mow down. How many of you know what that is? They, they, they were totally misunderstanding what communion was all about. It was not a time to load up on bread and wine. You're commemorating, remembering what Jesus Christ has done. And so in verse 22, says, What have you not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. He's saying you're doing it for the wrong reason. So let's look at what Paul did teach on that. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. So have the communion elements been passed out? They have, right? Says he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in what? Remembrance of me. In other words, you remember every place. In, uh, there's only one place in the New Testament where, Testament where he says it actually, uh, where people will take that one verse where it talks about, uh, for as often as you eat my bread and drink this cup, and they, they teach it in a way that this actually becomes... Christ's body. Listen, the Bible teaches that his body was broken once. Once. Everybody say once. Once for us. Okay, he's never going back to the cross again. That's why he said to do it in remembrance of him. He did it once. He did it for you and I once. And the Bible says he's at the Father's where? Right hand where he ever lives to make intercession for us. Now, when we take this wafer, when we take this bread, we, we are remembering before heaven, before hell, and everyone on earth, we are saying this, I know what Jesus did for me. His body was broken for me so that I could have healing in my body. His body was broken also so that we would all come together so there'd be one body, one body. One flesh. And he says, for as often as you eat this, recognize. And none of us can say, I don't need you. I've heard that through the years. Some churches or some people get in an argument and they'll say, I don't need you. Well, that's not true. We all need each other, okay? And if we don't have everyone needing each other, the Bible says if one member suffer, what? We all suffer. So everyone is important in the body of Christ. Everybody is important in the body of Christ. Everybody. The Bible says those who even have that we think have no honor upon them, we give more abundant honor. So never think that whatever, whoever you are in the body of Christ or whatever your duties are, are not important. They are very, very, very important. And you are important in God's plan for his body. Amen. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take heed. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. So let's partake of the bread at this time. And then I'm going to ask if Dan would ask God's blessing upon the bread. Mm. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. You knew what you came to do, and you still did it. So, Father, I thank you for that. In Jesus' name. The Bible says, after the same manner also, he took the cup. When he had stopped saying, this cup is a New Testament in my blood, this do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. 
For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes, or you do show that you understand what the Lord's death was all about. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. So when we have communion, we are supposed to examine ourselves. If there's any sin in our lives, anything that we know is unbecoming in God's eyes, we need to confess that. Any run-ins that we have with people, we need to confess that, ask God to forgive us and make it right. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, that means without even examining himself, without recognizing what Christ went through for us, eateth and drinketh damnation or judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brother, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that you come not together under condemnation. And the rest was set in order when I come. Well, I just want to take a minute here. You know, I went and visited at a hospital a number of years ago with a young woman who had had a run-in with her pastor. And I, uh, I was in the hospital visiting somebody else, and she asked if she could talk to me. And I went in and I, into the room and I talked to her. And she began to cry. And she began to say, you know, I love my pastor, but I did something that I shouldn't have done. And consequently, there was a, some long-term ramifications for a lot of hurt people in the church. And I love my pastor. I wish I could tell him I was sorry. I says, well, have you ever tried? She says, oh, he would never, he would never see me do it. Well, I went and I saw our pastor. And uh, I left the hospital, went and got him, and came back to the hospital. <laughs> oh, what a, what a joyful thing when she saw him and he saw her. And they both started crying. And they both came together. And he said, honey, I'm not holding anything against you. If God can forgive you, who am I not to forgive you? He said, I'm not, I'm not mad at you. And there was a long-term restoration, and it lasted until the day she died. See, that's what communion can bring into a body of Christ also. That's what communion can bring into a family. Don't let things fester for a long, long term. Let's make peace in our house. That's why the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be in thy house or your family. Bayeth, that's the Hebrew word, shall be saved. Amen. Let her suggest God's blessing upon the gift of Christ's blood for us. Father, we praise you, Lord God. Father, do we even understand, Father God, just how precious your mm. blood really is? Father, when we stood and everybody was in need of salvation, everybody in need of judgment, and this world doesn't seem to understand that much anymore. But Father, we need you. Mm, yes. And we still need you. Mm. And I pray, Father, that you would help us to remember, Father God, that there's only one thing that can take away sin. Amen. Yes. It's not how much we know. It's not how much we love. It's not how much we do all these other things. Mm, yes. It's your blood. Yes. And you made that special. And it's always going to be that. Way. Yes. So we give you the glory. We give you the honor. Yes. And we give you the praise for what you did in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's remember the blood of forgiveness. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. For your great plan, Father God, to bring us to your family. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Father God, for the body of Christ. Thank you, Lord, for the blood of Christ that was shed for us. Amen. Amen. Would you pass your communion cups to the center? Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Leonard. Amen. Amen. I was so happy today when I came into church. I asked Bruce and Mike and uh, uh, Mike Bradshaw uh, if anybody got shot yesterday over there at the uh, <laughs> gun range. Amen. And nobody did. And all I can say is hallelujah. Amen. 
I thought, oh man, they're going to all have guns over there. And then they explained to me that they take you through a, um, to show you, to make sure that you know what gun safety is all about before you're out there. Uh, I don't know why I've always been funny around guns. Uh, my brothers don't seem to have a problem with guns. And, but I've always been funny. Maybe it was because we were squirrel hunting one time and a gun went off and it went past somebody's ear. And, uh, I remember that. I remember almost shooting my father in the foot the one time. Uh, deer hunting. I, I had had my right thumb all bandaged up and we were walking into off of US 23 up in Oscoda. And my dad, when we got old enough to have a rifle, he would buy us a rifle. He bought me a lever action. And uh, I went to let the hammer back halfway with my bad thumb and walking into the woods at about 5.30 in the morning and I shot a chunk of concrete out from, uh, or asphalt by the side of his foot about that big. And I remember my dad, dad said, which way are you going? I said, I'm, I'm going that way. He says, no, you're not. He took the gun away from me and handed me the pump and he took that gun. But I, st I think he was probably shaking until about 10, 10.30 in the, in the morning, you know, about that gun going off. One other time I was up north deer hunting with a guy and he was a special needs young man. And I uh, shoved uh, the wrong gun, uh, gun shell in a, a deer rifle and he rammed it with a bolt action and it shot right past his dad's head. So you can see why I'm a little funny about guns, okay? Uh, I go the extra mile if uh, when someone's got a BB gun pointed down, if, if someone's putting an arrow in a thing, I'm kind of a little spastic because I'm thinking, you know, I don't know who's going to do what, okay? I thought maybe they'd ask the pastor to put a bullseye on his back and run across everybody, and I didn't want to do that, okay? But two weeks ago, Doug Malier taught a series or taught a subject by Dr. Lockridge about who Christ is, who God is. How many of you remember that? That was fantastic. You know, that, that sermon's been around for a lot of years, but people forget uh, just how uh, powerful that sermon was years ago. But there's another aspect of this that I believe Christians need. Joni and I have been talking about this lately. What, what kind of changed us? And uh, First was an encounter with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. When I hear somebody is having a difficult time, it was the first thing I pray, that they hear God's voice. How many of you ever heard God's voice? I mean, it is... It's powerful sometimes, sometimes it's real peaceful. But I'll tell you, once you hear that voice and you have that encounter with him, you'll never be the same person. So that's one thing we pray. When people are having a tough time identifying with Jesus Christ, I'll say, Lord, let him hear your voice. Let him encounter you. We had a phone call the other day that came in at about 1030 at night. And we hadn't heard from this loved one in our family for almost 30 years. 30 years. And we stayed on the phone for almost an hour with them and uh, they were talking about uh, God, they're talking about Jesus, talking about going astray, talking about what's going on in their lives right now. So that's one thing. Second thing that made a big difference in our life is we were taught about faith at a very young Christian age, 21, 22, we had to encounter cancer, uh, one to three years that they gave Joni and that uh, totally changed us where we ran after God like, like people don't run after God. Baseball didn't mean nothing. Football, basketball, we always loved sports. None of that stuff meant anything. The only thing that meant anything to us was the Word of God. Nothing. Nothing. I'm telling you, nothing meant anything to us. Couldn't get enough of the Word. Couldn't get enough of hearing the Word preached. Wore out the cassette players listening to Hagen, Fred Price, Marilyn Hickey, uh, Joel, uh, John Osteen, that's even before Joel Osteen, all these different ones. Couldn't get enough of hearing the Word of God. Third thing that helped us a lot was this. Identifying, getting your identity in Christ. Your identity in Christ. You know, there's all kinds of superheroes. I remember our, my little kids, Destiny, we used to have fun with them. Uh, I, I'd put on, uh, I'd have them put on uh, capes and that, and they'd run out in their underwear, and I would call them Pound or Man, you know. And they, uh, we'd all have all these different names, and there was identities. And I would ask them, I would say, what's Batman's uh, identity? 
What's his identity that nobody knows? Well, that's Bruce Wayne. How about Superman? That's who? Clark Kent. How about the Hulk? The ever-loving Hulk. 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 Bruce Banner, you got it, Aaron. Okay. How about Spider-Man? Peter Parker. How about Wonder Woman? <laughs> Not Linda Carter. I know what you guys are watching, okay? Diana Lane. <laughs> Diana Lane. But do you know, okay, you know who God is, and you know who, who Jesus is, and you know, uh, Doug talked about that, but do you know who you are? See, that's a question. If you, if you can't answer that question correctly, you're not going to live a victorious Christian life. If you can't answer that question, you're going to have problems. So let's open up and pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that when we leave here today, every man, woman, boy, and girl, everyone who's visiting with us for the very first time, everyone who's been here for a long time, would begin to see themselves in a way that they've never, ever, ever, ever seen themselves before. I pray this would change them so much on the inside that they would see that they are a somebody now. They're no longer a nobody. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go over to Exodus chapter 4 and verse 10. See, there have been some different responses through the years. When God shows up and he calls somebody to do something and how they respond. There aren't too many people that respond, hear my Lord, send me. There are places where, like Paul, Paul said, who art thou, Lord? And once he was told, whatever this man tells you to do, do it, he did it. But not many people respond accordingly. You've got to know who you are. Instead of living this secret identity. I was watching a thing on one of the Franklin Graham's stations last night with Joni. And there was a woman there who had had an abortion 40 years ago. She said, for 40 years I've been living in a closet. I didn't want anyone to know what I did when I was a 14-year-old girl that I had an abortion. She said, I didn't want anybody to know, but then there started being young girls and young guys who were having uh, sex, were having uh, problems, and babies were starting to be, girls were starting to get pregnant. And I heard God whisper my name. Now's the time. She said, I went home and I cried and I cried and I cried because I didn't want, I wanted to keep that in the past. I didn't want anybody to know my identity, what had happened to me years ago. But a lot of times, God will tell you, listen, you need to, instead of covering up your past and trying to be a, a, have a secret identity, your identity is what God has already brought you through and how you can help so many more people. Amen? So here we see Moses in Exodus chapter 4 and verse 10. He says, And Moses said unto the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore or, or up till now nor since, Thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. In other words, I can't talk. Would you teach a, a class? Oh, I can't teach a class. I remember coming, getting saved and hearing about my identity and who I was to be and everything. There, but I had something against me, and that was I had long hair. Some of you have heard that story. And I went to a Baptist church. They said, well, you can't teach here. They said, and you can't, you can't teach the young boys, you can't teach here. But what you can do, you can drive the bus because you have a chauffeur's license. So I started driving the bus. I said, you're not making me cut my hair. <laughs> Nobody's making me cut my hair. Okay. And I'd go to the preacher and I would say, doesn't nature itself teach us a shame for a man to have long hair? But up till now, we don't have any custom, neither the churches of God. So I said, they didn't have a custom and you shouldn't have a custom. The preacher said, well, that's okay what you say, but you're still going to get your hair cut. So I go to another church. They said, well, you can teach and you can have all that with long hair, but you can only teach 12-year-old boys. 12-year-old boys. I said, well, it's better than nothing. 
So I started teaching 12-year-old boys. Started seeing Christ work in 12-year-old boys. That's what the Bible says, let, a, uh, let someone first be proved. Study to show thyself approved unto God. See, don't, don't let all these things. Moses said, I can't talk. I can't talk. Take and turn with me to this one here. Let's go over to Judges chapter 6, verses 12 through 15. You have an identity. You have a past. Every one of you sitting in those chairs have a past. And some of you try to hide those pasts. Why hide? And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Underline that. What is, how does God look at us? As somebodies or nobodies? Somebody says, you're a mighty man of valor. And he hadn't fought one battle yet. And God, and Gideon said unto him, O oh oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us, then why has all this happened to us? And where be all his miracles, which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, O oh my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, but I am the least in my father's house. He's saying he's a nobody, and God is saying he's a what? Somebody. Until you as a Christian know you are somebody, I don't... A lot of times in Christendom, I'm amazed. People just know they're saved, and that's all they've, as far as they've went. They got saved, they got water baptized, they got commissioned, go into all the world and preach the gospel, they got filled with the Holy Spirit, and they still don't do anything. They don't do anything because they're still thinking about what they were. What they were. Everybody say were. Not are. Until you know who you are, you can't do nothing in the future. Or at the present time, you've got to know who you are in Christ Jesus. Take and turn with me over to Judges chapter 11. How many of you did not come from a lot of money? How many of you remember sugar sandwiches? Ke ketchup sandwiches? Potatoes? Sliced potatoes raw and eat them. How many of you remember a tomato soup and welfare cheese? Okay, there's a, now how many of you came from the other side of the tracks and you remember nothing but caviar and all the good things? Well, that's wonderful if you came from that. But even that doesn't equip you. You've got to know who you are in Christ Jesus. Amen? Judges 11. Now Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty man of valor, and he was the son of a harlot. Who are you, son? Well, my, my mother probably slept with 50, 60 people. That's a real good pedigree, right? Maybe 100, I don't know. See, if you're always fun, uh, talking about what happened years ago and don't bring it forward to what happened to you when you accepted Christ and you don't know it, you're stuck in the past. So you've got to know who you are in Christ Jesus now. It'll put a bounce in your step. It'll cause you to throw your chest up a little bit. It'll cause you to lift your eyes a little bit. It'll cause you to open your mouth a little bit. It'll cause you to look at yourself totally different. I remember the first time somebody said, told me, they said, you really think you're somebody? And as soon as they said that, I thought, I am. I am somebody. At one time, I'd have said I was nobody, but now I'm somebody. Well, what were some of the things you told them? I'm glad you asked that question. Take and turn with me over to John chapter 1 and verse 12. When someone asks you, who are you? I remember a lady the one time told me, whose boy are you? Because she had went to school with my dad's brothers and probably when well, she was a little younger than my dad. She said, whose boy are you? Well, I remember talking to my grandmother years ago. She said, we had some swindlers in her background. 
I'm the son of a swindler. <laughs> they said, right, who's, and then she started naming my uncles. And I'm thinking, oh, how she know my uncles? My uncles were pretty bad, some of them. They stole mail. They did some things that, there were rotten things to do. But I said, you know what? That's, my father's name is Harvey. And I said, don't judge me until you get to know me for a while. Till that time, I said, I hope you don't feel like that in a few years. Oh, it was the greatest thing through all these years to have her come up and plant a kiss on my cheek. Oh, man. Kind of like rubbing salt. Rubbing salt in the wounds. Kind of like putting the sugar on the butter sandwich, you know. Until you know who you are, you're not a threat to Satan at all. Let's go to John 1 and verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. How many of you have believed on the name of Jesus? Your identity then is what? A child of God. Well, three people said that. What are you this morning? Child, there you go. Okay, someone asks you who you are, what are you? I'm a child of God. That's who I am. I'm a son or daughter of the Most High God. And I don't care who knows that, amen? Take and turn to 1 John verse three, chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us, that we should be called sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Or, and the, actually, you can add, as we really are. We are what? Children of God. Somebody called the other day, and I called Bob Allen after they called. I haven't been in Chrysler's for 20 years. I haven't walked down one of them corridors. I haven't walked through there singing any songs. I haven't walked through there doing anything, witnessing to any of them. But somebody called and they called somebody who said, do you have Warren Hood's phone number? My husband is laying down in intensive care. He's in, got COVID. He's been here two weeks and he's not expected to make it. Would you call and help Warren pray for my, for my husband? If you don't think that makes you feel like you got superpowers. <laughs> man, you want to just fly right in there, okay, like Johnny Quest. <laughs> Would you have Warren Hood pray for my husband right now? Oh, man, it makes my eyes load up with tears thinking like that. That somebody would think, that, by, that guy's somebody. Who are you this morning? Who are you? You better answer that in the affirmative. Let's go over to Romans 8, 16 through 17. I picked up somebody's Bible. I don't know who it is. It's sitting over here in the, uh, right under the television set. There's a lot of notes in there. You stopped right about two-thirds of the way through the Bible. Not too many more notes. It's sitting over there. It won't do you any good right now, okay? There's a lot of writing in there about you started out knowing who you are. Finish the course, amen? Finish the course. Keep reading it all the time. When Joni wrote me the first love letter, man, I tucked that in my shoe, my wallet. Wherever I was, I must have read that letter thousands of times. I remember somebody saying, you got poop brown hair. I had to get past that. I thought, my hair, that don't look that bad, does it? But until you get past all that, until you get past all the name calling and see yourself in Christ, your new identity, you're going to still stay in the back, thinking you're nobody. Romans 8, 16 and 17, listen to what it says. And if children, everybody say, what are you? You're a child of God, right there. And if children, then what? Heirs. Don't say hairs. Heirs. Heirs of God. You ever say that? I'm an heir of God. And join heirs with Christ. So 
if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Wow. An heir of God. That means that everything he has is ours. Now, take a turn to Psalm 24, 1. I remember we're through all the different years now where God showed up when we needed finances. I remember all the different stories in this church where when God showed up when you needed finances. You know what he was telling you? You were a joint heir with Jesus. He's not poor. He's not poor. In fact, there's one place where he says, I'll whistle for it. Send him a couple grand. He needs it. If you keep your heart right, he'll do it for you, okay? Because you're a what? And you're a? Join there with Jesus. You're starting to get it. You're starting to get it. Psalm 24 and verse 1 says what? Would somebody read it loud? So how much belongs to God? All of it. And you're his what? Heir. It all belongs to him. Ray Kroc, at the end of his life, the guy who, who started McDonald's, I think he thought he could parlay that into get on to heaven, so he gave Salvation Army one and one quarter billion dollars. Not a million. I kept that article. You want to see it? I'll show it to you someday. One and one quarter billion dollars. That's a lot of flipping burgers, I'll tell you that. One and a quarter billion dollars. I probably got a million dollars invested in that myself, okay. An heir of God. Take and turn to Psalm 50 and verse 10. Why do you think God tells us to give? Because he needs it? Because he's poor? Why do you think he tells us to give it? He tells you to give it so you got some seed. My neighbor just, he had a septic tank all uh, dug up and he had to have a new field bed put in. And they brought, put in all the topsoil and all that. And he was out there sprinkling seed. And covering the seed with straw because if you don't seed something, you won't get any grass. Amen? Well, you guys don't know how to grow nothing. How many of you grow cucumbers, tomatoes, peppers? If you don't put any seeds out, what? You don't get anything. You're reaching over the fence at the neighbor's garden all the time. If you don't plant seeds, you don't get nothing. Now, look at Psalm chapter 50. And look at verse 10. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains, and all the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine in the fullness thereof. It's all his. And you're an heir of God, so if it's his, whose is it? It's ours. Take a turn to Haggai chapter 2 and verse 8. And you're a joint heir with Jesus. Oh, I know I'm saved, Pastor. I didn't say that. Do you know you're a child of God? Do you know you're a joint heir with Jesus? Do you know that? The Bible says, the silver and gold is mine, saith the Lord. And you're a joint heir with Jesus. Wow. All these different ones. S.S. Kresge started the Kresge Eye Foundation down in Detroit. We are, uh, in, it's right, it's, we're the safeguard of it down here in the city of Detroit. All of his fortune was put out there to help people see again. He got to the end of his life. He was a Christian man. He says, you know what? My kids got more than enough. I'm going to give this so that other people can be blessed. You're a joint heir with Jesus. Stick your chest out a little bit. Raise your head up a little bit. Stop slumping with them shoulders all bent over like you're not a nobody. You're a somebody in Christ Jesus. Stop having this secret identity. Take and turn over to Romans chapter 8, 35 through 37. When Joni and I heard these truths, it changed how we looked at life. Psalm 
circle that word who in verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril? That means trouble or sword. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are what? Underline that. What, who are you this morning? More than a conqueror. I was uh, talking and we were having a spirited discussion. We don't call them arguments. We were having a spirited discussion. And I was telling a guy, I said, you know what? America is the only country that we bomb them and then after we bomb them and destroy them, we go back and put everything back together. Isn't that what a more than a conqueror does? A conqueror just doesn't destroy it. He goes back there and re he rebuilds the lives of the people. You're a... You rebuild lives of people by how you live your life. That's what you are. You're more than a conqueror. You're not just someone that destroys people. You know, it was great through all those years. Down, when, after a while, when people call you names and that, and you don't respond in kind, after a while, when they start coming back to you and say, would you pray for this one in my family? Would you pray for that one in my family? Would you go to the hospital with me after work? And that, that means everything in the world. You know why they do that? Because they realize there's somebody in you. There's somebody in you. That secret, secret one on the inside is Christ in you. The hope of glory. That's why Paul says you have this treasure in you. We have this treasure in us. That the excellency might be of the spirit of God and not of ourselves. That's who you are. You have an excellent spirit. Daniel was, they, you go through the, the book of Daniel, you'll see that one of the things they recognize in him, one of the things they recognize in jo, uh, about Joseph in Genesis is that he had an excellent spirit. In other words, he saw himself differently from the way other people saw him. Remember Joseph telling everybody about the, the sun and the moon and everything bowing down to him? <laughs> you start talking like that, what happens? People think you got an ego. No, you're saying you know who you are in Christ. Are you with me right now? Look at this next one. Take a turn with me. Over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20. I remember hearing this sermon for the very first time. I still remember the guy's name is Claire Isabel, Pastor B.J. Ferguson. Do you remember that one? Do you guys remember B.J.? He had his bald as bald could be. He had the toilet seat hairdo, okay? And I remember B.J. standing up to preach. And he said, you are an ambassador of Jesus Christ. He said... Christ doesn't go any place if you don't go. He said, I want you to know that your attitudes, your words, your actions, your clothing, all reflect on whether you know who you are or don't know who you are in Christ. Everything. It all reflects on if you know you're an ambassador of Jesus Christ or you don't know. I've, I'm amazed at how many Christians say, I can live my life any way I want. Really? Not according to the word of God. You're an ambassador of Jesus Christ. Harvey and Roger had fishermen for Jesus Christ. I used to love seeing that jacket. I don't know if you've still got that jacket. Okay. Fishermen for Christ. Jesus said, follow me and I will make you. He didn't say, I'll make you the anchor. He said, I'll make you what? Fishers of men. That's what you are. That's what you are. Take a turn to Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13. I'd like you to teach a class. I can't do that, Pastor. I'd like you to help out in the nursery. I can't do that, Pastor. I'd like you to get up in the front. You've got a beautiful singing voice. I'd like you to sing and help Wyatt and Bruce. Him. I can't do that, Pastor. I'd like you to go down to the park and start setting up the PA system. And I can't do that, Pastor. 
Well, I want to know what can you do then? See, another thing I think we're going to touch that next week is this. Another thing that will revolutionize your life, is your, your Christian life, is when you use your gifts and talents for God. Okay? That will revolutionize your life. He didn't save you to sit. He saved you to get busy, okay? Who are you? Well, the Bible says here, I can't do all things through Christ which strengthens me. I can't do it. I can't. Can't do it. <laughs> Is that what that, the word says? I what? Help me. Oh, that's what I'm looking for. What? I can do all things through Christ. That's your identity. Somebody says, I'd like you to read this book about child rearing and that and help some of these young couples. I can't do that. But you raised your kids so good. I know, but I can't do that. Yes, you can. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. My boss would, used to say, Charles, uh, Clarence Reinhardt, he'd say, you never tell me you can't. I said, it wouldn't do you any good because you're still going to ask me to do it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now here's what I want you to do. I want you to write this down in your notes. There's over 140 phrases in the New Testament that tell you and I who we really are in Christ. You're not just saved. Oh, saved, but I'm saved, I'm saved. <laughs> no, glad, I'm glad. We, we sing that song, oh, saved, but I'm glad, I'm glad. Jesus has come and my cup's overrun. Oh, say, but I'm glad. Then 10 years down the road as a Christian. Oh, say, but I'm mad, I'm mad. <laughs> it don't wash. You're more than saved. Your identity is you can do great things because of Christ. Amen. Here's the phrase that you want to underline in the New Testament. These are going to identify who you are. The phrases are in Christ. In him, in whom, through him, by him, because of him. Underline these with, I don't care how you mark your Bible up. Put stars by it. Put lightning bolts by it. I don't care what you put by it, but those will tell you who you are in Christ and how he sees you. If you do this, it's going to change your Christian life. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 5.21. Then Lord, we just come a-hoping and a-praying. Is that what the Bible teaches? We just come a-hoping and a-praying, you'll do something. Let's see what the Bible says. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he hath made him to be sin, what? Underlined for us. He who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. How many of you are righteous this morning? Declare it boldly right now. Say, I'm righteous. Okay. Now, when someone says, would you pray for me? It says, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. You say, where can we find one? <laughs> where are we going to find a righteous man? Go like this. I'm the righteous man. I'm the righteous woman. That's me. Yeah, but I, you know, I, I, I hollered at my wife the other day. How many of you guys holler at your wife occasionally? Okay. How many of you wives holler at your husbands occasionally? How many of you are sorry you did it? How many of you holler at your kids occasionally? Did you find any place throughout all your reading of the word that says if you holler at your kids, you're no longer righteous? Did you find that? No. It just means that something, you realize something is irritating there. You just don't feel that way. And that's why the Bible says in 1 John 1, 8 and 9. It was written to Christians. It says if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to what? Forgive us our sins 
and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, if he cleanses us from all unrighteousness, then we have that sense again of we are righteous. There you go. That's your identity. Say, I'm righteous this morning. Gosh, I sure don't feel like it. It didn't go by that. That's what God declares about you. You're righteous. And he's looking for the righteous men and women throw their shoulders back, lift their head up a little high. I love that song, Lift Your Head a Little Higher. Yes. Oh, I like that. Start moving a little bit different because of who you are in Christ Jesus. Take and turn with me over to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7. I'm just giving you a few of these. In whom, there's that phrase, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Say, I'm forgiven. Say, I'm redeemed. That means, that word redemption means that God paid for it in full. The Bible says he is a propitiation for our sins and not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. Everyone in the world needs to know that. That God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And now he's given unto us that job of telling people, listen, God has forgiven you through Christ and we've been redeemed. He's, we've been bought back. We don't belong to Satan anymore. We belong to God. Amen. Who are you this morning? From those that verse, you are forgiven and you are redeemed. Say that with me. I am forgiven and I am Redeem. Somebody says, you really think you're somebody? What do you say? I am. I'm forgiven. I'm redeemed. I belong to God. I'm in his family. I'm a conqueror. I'm more than a conqueror. I'm a joint heir with Jesus. Go through the whole litany of things. I guarantee you they'll never ask you again who you are. <laughs> but when they get in trouble, guess what they're going to do? They're going to call for you. Amen and amen and amen. Take and turn with me over to Ephesians chapter 2. Now, I was going to read this all. What I could stay here all night, all day. Verse 1 says, he's quickened you. He's made you alive. Verse 2 says, you used to walk according to the course of this world. In other words, you used to act just like one of Satan's children. How many of you can identify with that? But how many of you don't identify with that no more? Amen. All right. And the Bible says we all had our conversation, our manner of life, in that, down to verse 4. But God is rich in mercy, but for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, has made us alive, quickened me, and made us alive together with Christ. By grace are you saved, and has raised us up together. Say that. Raised up together together. In other words, our behavior should be out of this world. <laughs> Look at the person next to say, out of this world. You should be acting, you and I should be acting like we don't belong to this world. Because guess what? We don't. You know, the Bible says uh, that we're pilgrims. That means we're just passing through. And I hear people say all the time, how, do you, how old do you think I look? How many of you know that's a trick question? I like what Smith Wigglesworth said. He says, I'm a young man on the inside, okay? The outward man is perishing. Yet the inward man is getting stronger and stronger every day. That's who you are today. That's who you are today. Let's go on in this narrative. Uh, verse 10 says, we're his workmanship. You know what that means? You're his garden. He's growing some special plants through your life right now. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works. After you come to Christ, your life ought to reflect good works. Verse 11 says, now you're no longer uncircumcised, but you're circumcised. You have the circumcision of your heart, the Holy Spirit, that new life in Christ that shows everybody your life has changed. Verse 12 says, at one time you were aliens, but now you didn't, back then you didn't have any hope. Verse 12 says, in the world. But now, everybody say, but now. but now. 
in Christ Jesus, you who some, sometimes were far off, are made close by the blood of Christ. Your identity is, if anyone can get in touch with God, guess who it is? Three people responded. If anybody can get in touch with God, who, who should that be? All of you. Amen? When, they, when God goes looking for somebody, he can call any of you in here. Well, call Aaron, Pastor Aaron, 1-800-AARON. He can do it. No, 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 no. That's where, the, where that country western song said, I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Lord, call me. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. Next verse. For he is our peace who has made both one and hath broken down. Oh, I got to go to verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. We just had communion. That's what it's talking about. We belong to him and he belongs to us. For he is our peace who has made both one, hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity or the division, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Say this with me, I have peace with God. You know, people always, I always like it when they'll say, would you go down to the hospital, Pastor, and talk to my loved ones so they can make peace with God? Well, I wonder if they die before I get there. Who talked to them? Who talked to him before you called me? Yeah, they did, right? So who, could, who had the opportunity to give them the peace? They did. You had that opportunity. Yeah, but I don't know how to say it quite right. I've had people just pinch their hand and say, would you like to ask Christ in your life? I remember a guy I'll never forget, a brother McCant, Willie, Willie McCant. They said he wasn't, he wasn't coherent. He couldn't hear. They said he's on life support. He can't hear. I'll, I, right down at McLaren Hospital, I walked in, I see you. That was, a, that was a wonderful time. Oh, I walked in there. I says, Brother Willie, I said, I'm here right now. I said, can I pray with you? I knew he was a Christian, but he wanted someone to pray. I walked in, and my eyes went like this. And my eyes went like this. Tears trickled out the side of his eyes. Man, don't think your prayers aren't powerful. That's right. Your prayers. Everybody say, my prayers. my prayers. Man, they're powerful right now. That's your identity. You pray with people. Yeah, but wonder if they don't respond. A lot of people don't respond. But wonder if they do. Let's see what take, took, takes place here. And he reconciled both unto God and the body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. And came and preached peace to you which were far off and to them which are nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Say, I have access to God. Access. access to God. Man, think about that. He's got a, a door and it's got God on there. He can open that door and go in anytime. Oh, Father, God, I need to talk to you about something right now. It don't look too good. We've had a brother-in-law that's been in ICU for, what, 35, 36 days now? It's been, been quite a while. But uh, yesterday we got some good news that he had 20 minutes of um, therapy. We got some good news. They pulled some tubes out. We got some good news that he opened his eyes. We got some good news that he's communicating with his eyes. We got some good news that he's forming words with his mouth. 30 some days later, I mean, my sisters were wearing that phone up. Text messages back and forth. Not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Staying in touch. Connie, we're praying. Everything's, God's got this. God's got this. 30 some days later, guess what? God's still got this. Amen. If you want to know who you are, who you really are, Confess the statements that I just told you about boldly every day. When Satan comes and reminds you of your past, how many of you ever had him remind you of your past? Just tell him about his future, okay? When people ask you the question, who do you think you are? I am a child of God. I am a 
joint heir with Jesus. I am more than a conqueror. I am what? All of those things, you say those things all the time and pretty soon you'll start seeing yourself a whole lot different. We've been watching a young girl's been coming on Wednesday night. I won't say her name, but she's been, she's been just going after the word of God like a dog to a bone, okay? Man, that old, that new Bible is getting all marked up like that. Oh, that's so pretty. I, you know, I, I don't ever want to mark my Bible. Man, this thing looks so bad. Looks so bad. But I'll tell you what, you show me somebody's Bible who's all broken up, you'll show me a life that isn't. Okay? Don't be afraid to mark up in there. If somebody asks you who, why you think you are that way, say, because I've been washed in the blood of Christ. Amen? Amen. Washed in the blood. Tell them I'm a mountain-moving believer. Amen? <laughs> Tell them that. Tell them all these things, and before you know it, guess what's going to happen? They're going to call you. 10.30 at night, 2.30 in the morning. Hey, can you pray for me right now? Oh, there was another coming here yesterday. I didn't even tell the guys. This guy called me from Chrysler's, another guy on my way over here, and he says, how was your Easter? I said, my Easter was great. I said, how was yours? He says, man, my Easter was fantastic. He said, I'm singing in the choir now. He said, I'm leaving the, leading the Stephen ministry. He goes to a Catholic church over in Highland and that, not Highland, uh, Howell. He said, I'm leading the Stephen ministry over there. He was telling me all that. He says, I'm in charge of our evangelism over there. He kept telling me all the things. He says, and all of it started with you sitting on a bucket. I was sitting on a bucket. He said, what are you reading? I said, I'm reading the Bible. I'm, I'm finding out everything I have in Christ Jesus. And boy, once he found out, he says, well, you know what? Can I get in on that? Yeah, you can. You know, they asked one woman why she was in the Bible so much. Uh, after she got older, she was in her 70s. When she came to faith in Christ, she's on cramming for the finals. <laughs> Don't wait to cram for the finals, okay? Start finding out what belongs to you right now in Christ Jesus, and it's going to make such a difference in you. You're going to say in a year, old oh, pastor, I am so glad I learned that. I'll never forget teaching these things in a church and people coming up afterwards, and they said, I did not know all those things that I have in Christ. That's because nobody told you. You know, um, insurance is a funny thing. Do you know you can pay for everything unless you make a claim on it? <laughs> I needed a partial plate. I don't want to talk too much about my partial plate, but I needed a partial plate, and I paid $550. And so I took a cash out of my money, Dave, uh, out of my pocket, and I gave him $550. And I asked him, what's my, I said, what, how much my insurance paid? He uh, got a big gulp, and he, I said, I know you know. I says, my insurance paid 550 I said, you're double dipping. And uh, he said, well, you know what, you can have your 550 back. I said, no, here's, here's how it is. You keep the 550 But I said, I'm not coming here, and my wife's not coming here no more. See, if you don't know what you have, you are going to get gypped a lot. And in your Christian life, if you don't know what God has purchased for you already in Christ, everybody say in Christ, you'll get gypped. Amen. Will you stand to your feet at this time? Amen. Just lift your hand towards heaven. Say, Heavenly Father, oh, I thank you that I am somebody in Christ. I'm one of your children. I'm a joint heir. I'm a more than a conqueror. I'm a righteous man. I'm a righteous woman. My father owns a cattle on a thousand hills. His ears are open unto my prayers. He watches over me because the Bible says the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. He sees me today. I'm an ambassador. I'm somebody going someplace with a message That'll change their life. No longer will I act like a nobody. No longer will I allow Satan to bring up my past. I'll bring up his future. Father God, 
when my feet hit the floor in the morning. Help me to be on fire. Help me to be passionate about the gospel. I'm no longer a can't-do person. I'm a can-do person. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Now that's going to change. And now next week, you know what you're going to find out? Your place in the body of Christ. Once you find out your place, get busy. Get busy. Amen. Aaron. Can I, can I get this one on, Zan, man? I told you guys a couple uh, a weeks back to share some testimony. Well, I got a testimony to share with you. This last Wednesday, you know, I'm, I'm the youth pastor, and we go to do youth, and only one youth showed up, Owen. Great, great guy. I love Owen. So I said, forget this. Jump in the car. Let's go get some ice cream. Okay, so he jumps in the car with me to get some ice cream. And we go out. Long story short, I end up praying with this young man who was trying to start his moped, and he gave his heart to the Lord asked for forgiveness right there on the spot. And one of the things he said to me, this young man, he said, you want to pray right here in front of everybody? And what pastor said today is absolutely true. You are more than a conqueror. Through him who strengthens you, through him who gives you that fire. So go out, get that testimony. And you know what else was a great testimony? Owen got to watch that happen. Amen. So go out, get those testimonies. Amen. Thank you. Well, Dennis and Dana are with us from Mississippi. And uh, Dana, you headed up the women's ministry at one time. Would you close us in prayer this morning? miss you yet. I want to ask you, how many of you have never went through a gifts inventory? Have never went through a spiritual gifts inventory? Never had any teaching? Yeah. Okay. Where gifts. Learn what your, your, your gifting, what God has gifted you with. We're going to learn that.